me for our weekly jam session. And this being the first Wednesday of the month, this is our Wednesday that we've dedicated to question and answer. So in place of our normal jamming together for this jam session, I will be taking your questions live and doing my best to answer as many as I can. I'm going to give high preference to music and piano related questions. And uh, just like I said, get as many through as many as I can in about 30 minutes is how long we usually take for these. And if you want to ask me a question live, you'll need to do that from our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash Hoffman Academy slash live. Just type in a comment and you can also let me know where you're watching from or any other interesting information that might help me answer your question, like what unit you're on, things like that. So I'm going to hop onto my phone and first of all, make sure that I'm actually live. Am I streaming? <laughs> This tells me that I'm streaming, but I'm not seeing it on my phone. Let me make sure that I'm actually live. Mm -hmm. So I can answer your questions. Okay, it usually tells me Hoffman Academy is live. And then I can like watch the stream. Hold on, let me go somewhere else. Bear with me. Go ahead and be typing in your questions and I'll be there like I said, as soon as I possibly can. Just navigating there. Hmm. Do we have a problem? So I'm not seeing my own Facebook Live. <laughs> Let's see here. If I can't find it, that tells me maybe you guys can't find it. Hold on. Oh, there I am. There I am. Okay. I found myself. <laughs> okay, here we go. Question time. Hello to Grace in Pennsylvania. Glad you're watching. Noah and Asher in Houston. Hello, hello. Who is my favorite composer? That's a great question. I don't have one favorite composer. There are several that I love. I love Bach. His music is so complex and stimulating and interesting. I love his choral music. If you're not familiar with that term, choral means music for a choir or like a group of people who sing together. That's called choral music. And Bach has written some amazing choral music for choir and orchestra. Uh, some of his cantatas are some of my all time favorite music. But Bach also wrote a lot of really great keyboard music. You know, he wrote some great invention that I love playing to this day. That was his invention number eight in F major, um, this prelude. also by Bach. Love it. I also love Chopin. Chopin is amazing. His music is very passionate and interesting, very expressive, full of lots of emotion. Like, here, my chord is going the wrong way. Um, a piece I've been working on uh, this past year is his, uh, one of his ballads. <laughs> Uh, that's a little excerpt from a Chopin ballad that I love playing. Uh, Chopin also writes some very beautiful music like this etude. Uh, I also love Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff is great on piano. He also wrote some great choral music. My top three might be Bach, Chopin, and Rachmaninoff if I had to choose three just off the top of my head. But so many great composers to explore. Great question. Uh, June is asking, can I play Fur Elise for you? 
Well, I won't play the whole thing because it's kind of long, but I'll play the first 10 seconds. What is my favorite pattern play book? asks Iris in Kentucky. And uh, if you're not familiar with the pattern play series, do I have one here today? I think I left those at home. Uh, the pattern play books are what I've been using most weeks at our jam session. Uh, there are like eight different pattern play books by Forrest Kinney. They're all excellent. And I've gotten lots of great ideas for our jam sessions from those books. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, book one is maybe my very favorite. He, he put a lot of, I think, some of his very best ideas in that book one, but so many good ideas in all of the books. Let's see. Hello to Todd in Texas in Unit 3. Glad you're watching today. Teresa is asking, what, were, what was I for Halloween? Uh, I was lame this year. I got sick on the day before Halloween and I just kind of gave up. I was planning a, a little get together for my sons and some of their friends and I wanted to make a treasure hunt that would like take them to different places around the neighborhood so they could do an activity outdoors uh, to be safer for COVID. And so I was planning out this epic treasure hunt where they had to go to the park and then go find something in the shed and then go uh, to like different places. And I spent so much time planning out that treasure hunt that I didn't have time to figure out a costume. So I was just Mr. Hoffman for Halloween this year. Kind of boring, I know. But we had a really great treasure hunt and uh, that made up for it. Did I ever compose a song? Asks Samidha. And yes, I've composed lots of music over the years. Uh, if you get to some of the higher units, you'll come across some pieces that I composed myself, like there's one piece, I think it's in unit 12, called Amazing Day. Let's see. I haven't played it in so long. That's just a little part of Amazing Day that I composed, and you'll get to that in somewhere around unit 12. I think composing is a lot of fun. If you're learning piano, I think you should compose. I think it should be a part of every student's learning journey. If you're learning to play the piano, don't just learn other people's music. Try making your own music. And it can start with improvisation. Improvising is really a part of composing. I think the two are very closely related. Most composers improvise to get some of their best ideas. You just sit down at the piano and see what happens. Just try out different sounds, different ideas. Noelle is asking, how do we play chords for a song that we don't have sheet music for? Uh, thanks for that question, Noelle. Uh, a few ways you can approach that. I, when I hear a, maybe I just watched a movie and I heard uh, some music from that movie that I really liked, I may just go to my piano and try and figure it out for myself by ear. That's called playing by ear. You hear the music and you don't have the sheet music. You just, huh, what did that sound like? Like sometimes I'll hear something from Star Wars. I'll be like, oh, that was really cool. You know, like the force theme. Is this the force theme? And it's, it's just a lot of fun to experiment with what you can figure out. Uh, it takes practice. I didn't used to be able to play by ear. When I was a kid, my piano teachers never talk to me about playing by ear, but I try to get all of my students listening and figuring things out on their own. It's a great skill to develop. It just takes practice. And as far as the chords, you asked about how do I know which chords to play? 
again, like, it will come with experience, like with this Star Wars song. You'll start to hear, oh, that sounds like a minor chord. So I knew to add that F minor chord and then, and then that chord has a major sound. And then you'll just, the more experience you get with music, just like with a language that you learn, you'll start to recognize words. Oh, I know that word because I've heard it so many times. And you'll start to hear, oh, I know that's a major chord, not a minor chord. So the more you listen and just start to notice, see if you can recognize the difference between major chords and minor chords, or if you hear like a diminished chord, you know, diminished chords have a very unique sound. And you'll just start to recognize that as you go through life and hearing music around you. Kira in Massachusetts asks, sometimes my hands hurt when I start playing, why? That's a great question, Kieran. I'm glad you're asking about that because it's really important to me that you feel comfortable when you play. Usually, I would say in almost every case, you should not have pain when you play. Pain is usually your body's signal that something is wrong and that you need to pay attention to something to uh, prevent damage from occurring in your body. And so things like piano posture are your number one way to avoid pain. So just make sure that for, for um, let's just go through those four things on my piano posture checklist that we talk about way back in unit one. Where is your bench? If your bench is too close to the keys, remember your your elbows are gonna be cramped and that will create tension all the way through your shoulder and arm. So you need to make sure your bench is comfortably back from the keys. You don't wanna to go too far back, of course, but your elbows should float slightly in front of you. Also, your bench needs to be high enough that this part of your arm, called your forearm, is pretty much parallel with the ground, meaning it's flat. Um, and then, of course, your fingers are going to have some curve, but from your elbow to your knuckles is pretty much level, parallel, or flat to the ground. Uh, and if you're, for example, sitting too low, if your bench is a low bench or you're sitting in a chair and most chairs are too low, that will force your arms to kind of be at a weird angle. So again, you want your forearm parallel to the ground. And then you want your hand and finger shape to have this nice, comfortable, relaxed shape. If you feel any tension or pain, you know, take a minute, just shake out your hand, get floppy. Go back and watch my posture lesson in unit one for some ideas on that. And then last of all, arm weight. You know, when you're playing, don't, don't use your fingers to make the sound. Use gravity and let your, kind of think of your hand just falling into the keys. It should feel just as easy as just dropping your hand on your lap. And that's the concept of arm weight. You wanna just let the weight of your arm help you make the sounds. You're just dropping into each key. Rather than think of playing with finger action like this, think of playing with the help of gravity. I hope that makes sense. Try out those things and uh, again, thinking about where your pain is happening. Like, is it happening in your wrist? Is it happening at your elbow? That can maybe give you a clue where your tension is. Sometimes pain is caused by tension. Just make sure, playing the piano should feel comfortable. You should feel relaxed and comfortable while you play. I think I forgot to mention tall back with relaxed shoulders. Uh, I think that was everything from the checklist. Great question, Kira. Uh, Penn is asking, we are using a keyboard for lessons without weighted keys. Will it be tricky to transition? That's a great question. I highly recommend that you get on a keyboard with weighted keys as soon as possible. This is a digital piano, so it's electronic, but it has weighted keys keys and that will do a pretty good job of developing finger strength and coordination and agility 
If you're on a keyboard without weighted keys, when you switch to an acoustic piano, or if you ever happen to play on an acoustic, on an acoustic piano or on a digital piano, you're, you're going to feel kind of clumsy and like, ugh, you don't know what you're doing. It's kind of like if you, I don't know, always walk around with crutches and then suddenly you take the crutches away, you're going to feel really weak. Uh, and I would just encourage you as soon as you can afford it, and I know they're more expensive, but try and get on a digital piano as soon as possible. And yes, it will probably be a tricky transition at first, but you know, I bet within a month or two, you can probably get used to it. You may just have to go back to some easier material at first because you may just find that your fingers aren't quite as strong as you want them to be for playing on a, an acoustic piano. Great question. Paul asks, are you making a unit 15? Uh, I'm working on unit 14 right now. And once I'm done with that, yes, there will definitely be a unit 15. I don't have any plans on stopping until we're in the 30s. You know, I'm kind of roughly mapped out to around unit 35 or so. So there will be many, many more units to come. Uh, Echo asks, should we be concerned about bad habit formation if young children are not able to play with, quote, correct piano posture from the beginning, fingers, arms, and wrists? Uh, I would say you should be concerned, but not overly concerned. Like, I want you to be appropriately Concerned, And just know that not everything's going to come together all at once. But posture is something I want you always thinking about. So never just be like, ah, forget it. This is too hard. But also don't be so strict about it that it becomes like a miserable experience. So what I try to do with my students is I choose one thing at a time to focus on. And, you know, I give them the checklist and we get it all set up. But then I know that as they start playing, some of those things may start drifting. But I'll just keep bringing them back. Be like, hey, remember, let's pull your bench out a little bit. Or, hey, remember, let's, let's try and play with fingers in a really great, naturally curved shape. Or let's work on not having this joint can you see, like if it bends backwards like that, um, that's not great for piano. You want it to stay in this outwardly curved shape. Okay, not this. You don't want that knuckle to bend backwards like this. You want it to stay like this. And uh, that takes time, you know. Kids, little fingers at five, six years old, um, those may take some time to strengthen. And, you know, you can do little games with it. I saw one piano teacher, uh, I'm on a piano teacher's Facebook group, and one piano teacher created this really fun looking game where the kid was just leaning up against a door and they were doing different rhythms by kind of falling against the door and trying to keep the fingers in this shape, not that shape, if you can see them kind of bending backwards like that, you know, keeping them outwardly curved and just doing like quarter notes or eighth notes, T, T, or whole notes, one, two, three, four, and just practice keeping the fingers in that shape. Or in some of my lessons, I talk about doing a little exercise where you're pushing against the fingers. Um, but students take time to establish all of these habits. So I want to be persistent and consistent, but also give them space to be able to make music. I, I want kids to have the joy of making music. And so I don't want to stop them from making music to fix the posture and make everything perfect. But I also don't want bad habits to get too ingrained. So again, it's something that we talk about frequently and consistently. Um, but things like getting these joints, that usually takes students some time to master 
Um, but things I really want to watch out for are bench. I don't want their wrist. A bad habit that I would try to avoid right from the beginning is not letting the wrist have this shape. You always want the wrist to be more or less parallel with the forearm and to have some flexibility. I like to see a little bit of a bounce as students play. Um, that tells me that their wrist isn't locked in place. So those are the things I'm watching for with posture habits, you know, finger shape, um, wrist, bench. And yeah, I think it is important to try and get good habits from the beginning, but just make sure it's approached with joy and uh, recognizing that it does take time. It takes months, if not years, to really integrate all those habits. Great question. How long does it take to compose a symphony, asks Teresa. Uh, I've never composed a symphony. I imagine it would take some serious time. Beethoven, who wrote a lot of music in his lifetime, only composed nine symphonies his whole life, which would tell me that you know it probably took him weeks, if not months, to compose a symphony. Mozart, his symphonies were shor shorter, and Mozart composed, what was it, 34, 35 symphonies, somewhere around there. So he composed more symphonies, but he composed like, in total, Mozart composed over 500 compositions in his lifetime, but only 30-something were symphonies. Uh, so that may tell you that symphonies are pretty big accomplishments for a composer. You know, a, a composer may only compose a few or a dozen on the higher end. Uh, in Mozart's case, you know, a few dozen uh, symphonies in your whole life. Naira in Colombia in Unit 4 is asking, why are there lots of E's in Furilis? Yeah, in this theme... It goes back and forth between this E and this D sharp a lot, right? You can see that. That theme, I don't know, it's just kind of this magical theme, right? Everyone recognizes that. How did Beethoven come up with that? It's just so kind of wistful, romantic, a little bit sad, a little bittersweet. Uh, I don't know. There's... I mean, sometimes music doesn't have a logical explanation. It creates more of a feeling. Uh, Beethoven maybe could have chosen to written it in a different key, you know? What if he had written it in F minor? Doesn't quite sound the same though, does it? It's too low, you know? Right here, it's like the perfect place for it. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have an answer. You'd have to ask Beethoven. But that's a great question. I'm glad you're thinking about that. How big was the dog that my teacher had? Do you mean the one that knocked me into the swimming pool? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It, was, it probably felt really big because I was only like seven years old. Uh, he seemed like a big dog. <laughs> I don't know. Naira asks, what would be my advice if I want to study music at the conservatory? Well, uh, Naira, I would say work hard, practice every day, be really consistent. Uh, I would recommend getting a great teacher. My online lessons are, I hope you find them really useful and wonderful, but a live teacher, if you're serious about being a musician, at a conservatory level and you are thinking about a career in music, a live teacher would be extremely helpful to you, I believe. And so you might look around for a great teacher who could help you achieve that goal. Hello, Abby. Abby is nine and she's asking, can we request songs to be added to the popular music list? I would love to learn one of the songs from the Amelie soundtrack. Great question. We used to have like a request list, but the request list ended up with over a hundred songs on it. And I just can only do so many videos per year. I try to put out one new video per week. 
Um, but I'm mostly focused on my units, not on popular songs. There are just so many popular song tutorials like on YouTube and other places that I found I couldn't quite keep up on that front. And I've chosen to focus more on a traditional, you could almost call it a classical music education. Although I do bring in, I try to bring in fun and modern styles like jazz and 12 bar blues and improvisation, uh, movie songs and, and things like that. But I'm trained classically and uh, so I've chosen to focus most of my time on that. You're welcome to make requests, but honestly, we have so many songs already on our request list. It won't, there's not a great chance that I would get to it anytime soon. And so I don't wanna disappoint you if you request something and, and it doesn't happen. But thank you for asking that, Abby, and I hope you can find, you know, if, if you, of course, use your parents, uh, get your parents to help you uh, if you're doing internet searches, but uh, you can find other tutorials uh, off of Hoffman Academy. There are other um, video tutorials that may help you learn the song you want to learn. Uh, Paul's asking, I was looking for sheet music for O Tannenbaum, which is uh, the German name for O Christmas Tree. Uh, what company should I order it from? That's a good question. Paul, will you direct message us on Facebook and I, I can give you a couple of ideas, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. In fact, we, Hoffman Academy may even have a version that you could use. Um, we're working, I'll give you a little sneak peek. Uh, myself along with two of our teachers are working on a Christmas collection of songs for, um, and that will probably be one of them. So if you wanna work with Paul, we might be able to help you, but if you're looking for something now, there, there are some options I could help you with. Um, Daria in New York City is asking, can I play Pirates of the Caribbean? I don't have the music to Pirates. Oh, wait. I could play something from Mr. Hoffman's Popular Hits for Piano. Well, just because you asked. Uh, I forgot I had this book here because I was showing you guys this last week. Um, here's a simplified version that actually, uh, if you're in like units 11, 12, sorry, 12, 13, or 14, you could probably tackle this. The fun thing about this book, uh, it comes with, you get access to online backing tracks. So you can play along with like a full orchestra uh, doing that piece. And I think you can adjust on the Hal Leonard website where you get these backing tracks, you can adjust the speed. So if you wanna slow it down for practicing and then gradually speed it up. And there's a version where you hear the piano part and then there's one where the piano part is taken away because you're gonna play. Uh, the piano part with the track. So uh, hope you enjoyed that. Daria and everyone else, Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Mindy asks, who is my favorite movie composer? Definitely John Williams is my favorite. I mean, there are lots of great ones, but his melodies and harmonies are just so original and interesting. You know, when I listen to movie music, a lot of it just gets very repetitive. They use like the same chords 
over and over again, maybe the same three chords, the same two chords, the same rhythms. And John Williams is just so inventive. His melodies never get repetitive. They're fresh and they're interesting and his harmonies are interesting. It's just a delightful mix of complexity and charm and heart. Um, a similar way to why I love box music. You know, box music has a complexity to it, but it also has a, a lot of heart in it. And that's what I love about John Williams. Kaylin from Houston asked, do I like Star Wars? Yes, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Uh, let's see. Hello to Timothy in California. Hello to Christy in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, Lila in Florida is asking, what songs I'm planning to add in Unit 15? And she's requesting Mozart in the future. Um, there is a Mozart piece I considered for Unit 15. It's this one. But it's a minuet. We've already done so many minuets. I'm like, oh, should we do another minuet? But, uh, you know, minuets were really popular in the day. That was like their dance music. If you go to a party these days and, you know, you see people on the dance floor dancing, dancing to pop music. Well, back in Mozart's day, you would go and you would dance the minuet. You know, this was their party music. And so there are hundreds, probably thousands of minuets by many composers. Uh, looked like I was frozen for a second. So that's one I might add, Lila. I'm not sure yet. I'm focused mostly on unit 14 right now, but I can give you a sneak peek of the next song that's coming up in unit 14, and it's The Wild Horseman. <laughs> So you can look forward to that one soon. It's a really exciting piece by Schumann uh, coming up in Unit 14. Unit 15 is still uh, not, not very far planned out. Uh, Turkish Martin un Unit 15 could be cool. I will check that one out. Uh, let's see. Echo is asking, I learned a piece by myself. I'm sure I didn't miss a note and been practicing to perfecting it for a long while, but no improvement. What's my recommendation for the next step? You know, I found, I got this advice from my favorite piano teacher, who is Alfred Mouladou. He was the pianist for the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And he told me that to be working on multiple pieces at the same time, because he told me if I would work on one piece, really hard. Sometimes you can come back to a different piece that maybe you'd put on the shelf for a while and you'll be better at it. Just sometimes by working on other pieces, it like just helps your brain make, your brain has a subconscious region where it's doing stuff that we can't even tell sometimes. And by working on other pieces, sometimes you can get a breakthrough. So if you kind of feel stuck, like you're at a plateau, go on to something else and come back and sometimes that will help with the breakthrough. And just also remember that learning isn't always just a constant climb. Sometimes there will be a plateau and you may feel like you're not making any progress, but if you're patient, you can uh, find that growth again. So just be patient with yourself. But again, I would recommend shaking things up and trying a different piece. Uh, it's good to, I think, to have two to four pieces that you're working on simultaneously. Uh, Chira Wan asked, what is the first song I ever played? Well, I was just thinking about this the other day when I was teaching about, um, in unit 13, about chromatic scales, which is where you go every single key, white and black. And I, my first song that I composed, and one of the first songs I played was this song that I called the spider song, because it sounded like a spider song to me. And I just made this up when I was probably like five years old. It was just going up and down on the three black keys and the two white keys in between, just going up and down by a half step. That was my first song. The Spider Song. Let's see. Um, we are running out of time. So I'm going to finish with a question from Daniel. 
Do I have any pets? Yes, I have a very cute little dog. It's a puppy. We just got back in March. Her name is Gala. And she's just a little thing. She weighs about 10 pounds and you know, you can pick her up with one hand easily. Uh, just really sweet. She's half Havanese, half Coton. I think I'm saying that right. And uh, I mean, yeah, super cute. I know I didn't get to everyone's questions, but uh, we got a lot of them and we're gonna do this again next month. So please join me again next month uh, for our question and answer session. We'll keep this tradition of the first Wednesday of the month will be dedicated to answering your questions. And next Wednesday, we'll be back to our usual jam session where I will teach you a little mini lesson on improvisation. We'll make some music together and uh, we'll finish with shout outs as usual. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you're all staying safe and happy and healthy in this crazy world. We uh, are just going to keep making music here at Hoffman Academy. That's how I find peace. If I need extra peace on a rough day or a rough week or a rough year like this has been for a lot of us, go and make music and see how you feel. A lot of times I think you'll feel better. Even better, make music with someone else. I love playing duets. You can improvise together. I've given you lots of ideas for improvising duets uh, this whole year as we've been doing these jam sessions. You can go back to our archives uh, to review any of those past ones if you want uh, some fresh ideas. But just know that I'm really grateful that you guys are learning piano with me, that you're part of our community. I appreciate when you uh, share about Hoffman Academy with someone you know and spread the word. We've heard from a lot of people that uh, you first heard about Hoffman Academy from someone you knew, and that really helps us grow. So I appreciate all you do to help spread the word about what we're doing here. We want to, our mission at Hoffman Academy is to bring music into people's homes around the world, get more people making music in more homes, making music together. It's a great way to build community and to be more alive, more human. Humans are meant to be creative. And whether you create music or art or dance or poetry or cool stories, be creative, be a creator and create beauty and happiness and good things in the world. There's so much you can do to create happiness. Thanks for watching and learning with me and I look forward to seeing you all back next week. Bye everyone.